Hey, once again, good morning and welcome here to Central Baptist Church. I know that some of you probably just joined us, maybe just found us uh, online. My name is uh, Archie Mason. I'm the senior pastor here at Central. been here for about 15 years now, and so we're so glad that you've joined us. We're in a brand new series called Kinfolk, and kind of our tagline of that, it's my family, it's my fight. And so thank you again uh, for worshiping with us this morning. I hope everyone has a Bible if you don't. Uh, you can take your phone. There's a lot of translations that are out there. I always teach from a New American Standard uh, version of the Bible. If you don't have our app, I would encourage you to download uh, that app. You can find it and go to centralbaptist.com and get some more information about that. Look it up. Uh, but it also has a Bible translation. So if you got your Bible, let's take it and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this morning, uh, we're going to pick up in verse 1. And then also, too, just a couple of things, because I know how people kind of come into Facebook and YouTube and kind of catch up with us so you didn't hear everything uh, right uh, in the uh, beginning. If you have a question or you got a prayer request, want somebody to pray for you, I mean, it's confidential. We've got pastors who are online. You can kind of go over in that uh, chat room area, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, however that works, whatever social media platform you're on. And so we've got uh, those pastors there uh, watching and waiting and uh, looking to hear from you. So at any time, any question, uh, any comment, or God does something in your life, man, let us know. Let them know. And so they'll begin uh, that conversation with you. And then also, too, we're pointed toward May the 10th. We're here in Arkansas. And so we have an opportunity, it appears, and we'll see kind of how the governor, he's kind of watching that and our state uh, reopening some things from restaurants, movie theaters, the gyms to uh, all kinds of stuff. And so uh, in the first initial phase, it looks like churches are included that in the week of May 4th. So we're pointed toward May the 10th. And so we're going to have some protocol issues and social distancing and space. We have multiple venues, multiple rooms. Uh, we can have multiple services, so we can have small groups of folks that make up the church. And so uh, that's kind of where we're pointed. There'll be more information coming uh, in the days ahead, but we're going to ask you to register for uh, which service you plan to attend. And so we'll kind of know, and there'll come a place where that's all that we can hold and uh, go by the six-foot distancing rule and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so it's kind of fluid. And so you just need to kind of keep up with us and pay attention to that. Now, during this uh, pandemic that's taking place, the coronavirus, uh, you know, there of, uh, we, we see the, the negative things that uh, are happening with that and the number of deaths. Man, and man, we just want to pray and pray for folks in our nation around the world and families that have experienced a loss of life. And uh, just as we always do, pray for healing, uh, pray for do that. But uh, in regard to the family, and that's why we're in this series called Kinfolk, I shared this last week. We had set this up on the preaching schedule to be here today long before we knew that the coronavirus was going to impact our nation and, and the way it has. And uh, so we know that, uh, as we're going to look at today, we know there's some negative things in the families that causes a lot of uh, internal stress. And so we're going to talk about how to cope with that and how to, uh, you know, know God's truth, to fight for your family, not with your family. And the way you do that is to, uh, uh, man, fight to know uh, God's truth. But there, there are some funny things that have kind of happened and taken place, if I can say it like that. I don't know if you're like me, but uh, uh, I've got some friends that have been experimenting cutting their own hair. And uh, men, and uh, you know, all I can say is, I, I guess you call it a bad haircut, you know, and, it, and it's it's a uh, kind of a, a funny uh, in a way. But I would encourage you, man. I've got a co-laborer in Christ, a good friend, Bob Snell, who cut his own hair, and uh, I am uh, would encourage you to maybe petition him. Uh, to uh, let him show his hairdo uh, to you, maybe through Facebook. Now, he didn't know I was going to do that, so there we go. Uh, also, Angie was telling me, uh, too, about the ladies. She says a lot of the ladies are really saying their natural hair colors coming out. So that's just some of the things I think that are kind of uh, funny. I'm kind of holding out on cutting mine yet, but it, it may come uh, to that. So uh, I know that's uh, some of the things that uh, uh, have uh, taken place. I just kind of uh, laugh about that we see uh, this going on. So what we're doing, we're just doing... Uh, what we need to do, what we have to do uh, during this time. And so we're all in this together. You know, here in Jonesboro, we say we're Jonesboro strong, but most importantly, uh, we are Jesus strong, right? And also, though, but we know that there are a lot of, uh, man, the internal stresses and pressures uh, that are, are coming out of this. If you have uh, young children uh, at home, uh, you know, Angie and I have kind of laughed about this too. I said, man, don't you know uh, this is tough? 
on uh, moms and dads and young children at home when they're normally uh, in school. And I, I've kind of said this to Angie. I said, you know, there will probably be a greater appreciation for teachers than there ever has been before uh, after this is over with, uh, you know, and, and, and doing that. And so we do appreciate, man, we appreciate all of our first responders, workers in the hospitals, and uh, all the folks, teachers still trying to teach online and doing those things. But we see some of those stresses, and with that, there just come some issues that are in the family. And so you may be in a, man, maybe you're in a good spot, and the Lord is really blessed and with your family, and you're experiencing some great uh, family time uh, together, or you may be in a place because the enemy is attacking the institution of the family because God gave us a family. So you may be in a place where the enemy is just really coming after in an onslaught, and, and maybe there's been some anger, and maybe some words said that uh, that shouldn't have been said, and those things. Maybe you need to ask some forgiveness. And so today, Today, we're going to be looking at uh, a passage of Scripture that uh, really teaches us how to, man, fight for our family and some things that we need to put in place and practice. I got a picture of my two boys when uh, they were young. Uh, most of you know my story. Angie and I, we got married when I was 23. I got saved when I was 25. Uh, Ty was born when I was 27. And I was called to ministry and started attending seminary about the age of 30. I can remember, you see Ty there on the left and Taylor on the right. They're 16 months apart. And uh, so I remember the day that I was getting ready to go to seminary and Ty on the left, he was getting ready to start kindergarten. And he asked me, he said, Dad, I got a question for you. I said, what is it, Ty? He said, do you know your colors? I said, my colors? He said, yeah. Do you know the difference between blue and red and yellow? I said, yeah. He said, you know, when you start school, you got to know your colors. I said, okay, Ty. Uh, you know, that was some of the things that conversations that we have. I can remember seeing Angie uh, at times. God had blessed us, and uh, she was uh, able to stay at home uh, with their boys, and she'd have one on each hip. I mean, so I, I know the stresses and strains uh, in a family, but, but I also know that God can speak through your children to you at times when you uh, least expect it. Uh, some of you know, too, my uh, story that even when I was in seminary, I had an ag business that I ran, and so uh, I did some agronomy work, and so it, it helped me to kind of stay alive in seminary and provide my family and allow Angie to stay home, and so uh, I can remember doing soil sampling and testing. We had a lot of acres under contract, and Angie would bring the kids out uh, to be with me a lot of times riding four wheeler when I was taking soil samples. And so uh, Ty and Taylor would come out, play in the dirt, do that kind of stuff. And I remember one day when Ty looked up uh, at me and he made a statement to me as a, a young boy. He was probably five or six years old at that time. And again, I was in seminary uh, and I was still scouting and I was working at the church some part time, just trying to stay alive, just working, trying to stay alive and provide my family. And uh, he looked up at me and he said, Daddy, he said, uh, I want to be just like you when I grow up. Now, as a young boy, and the Lord really spoke to him. Now, you know, in, in, at the age of five or six and, uh, you know, that relationship with a, a, a young son and uh, him making that statement to me. Uh, and I know he was, you know, he might have been, hey, I want to I wanna play in the dirt like you when I get older. Maybe that's what he was thinking. But the Lord used those words to really speak to me. Now, I was in seminary, and God was doing a, a great working in my life. And, uh, and I was driving uh, four days a week, 150-mile round trip, and leaving early in the morning because I had morning class so I could work in the afternoon. And uh, uh, so I was learning so much. But when Ty, when the Lord spoke through Ty and he said those words to me, I really realized that I had such a great responsibility for my family. A great responsibility. I was a steward of what God had given me. So I know that some of you today, they're watching at different places. Some of you don't have children. Uh, you may not be married. Or you may be a single mom, single dad, or you may have a blended family. So what we're going to look at today applies to all of us, whatever situation. I know there's boys and girls, there's teenagers uh, that are watching, uh, single individuals that are watching. This applies to all of us today of how uh, to be that person that doesn't fight with our family, but fights for uh, our family. So this morning, I'm going to read uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I've talked through this passage before, uh, even back last fall. So I'm going to teach back through it again. So it may be a reminder to some of you. But man, I'm praying that God will speak to you from his word this morning. So there at home, wherever you are, if you don't mind, stand. I know some of you in your uh, lounging pants, your pajamas, whatever it may be. Hopefully you got the word of God and uh, with you, maybe on your phone or you're holding it like me. But 
follow along or even read out loud there at home uh, or wherever you may be as I read. Now, this is the commandment. This is the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. Now, this comes from Moses, okay? This is a Pentateuch, first five books of the Old Testament. He said, but the Lord has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you're going over to possess it, so that you and your son, your grandson, might fear the Lord your God to keep all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gate. So what Moses is telling folks here, he says, man, the word of God should encompass everything uh, in your life. And so that's what we're going to talk about and look at today as we really work through how to fight for your family uh, and not with your family and how to know God's truth and to show God's truth. Hey, pray with me again. Father, uh, we have such a great uh, honor. Uh, We have such a great opportunity to come before you in prayer because, Lord Jesus, you, you opened access for us to pray through your blood, which was set on the cross. And so we do not take that lightly. And so, Lord, we call upon today. We ask you to teach us. We pray that you will instruct us. Uh, Holy Spirit, we pray you give us illumination uh, of the passage and understanding uh, of the passage, Lord, this morning. I pray we worship through the teaching uh, of your word this morning, Lord. I pray that you stir our, our heart uh, in this. And, uh, Lord, as I always pray, man, I, I know there's so many people uh, that are watching. I know we got a lot of our church family and members who are part of this church uh, that are watching. But, Lord, there's so many other folks. This may be the, the first time for many people to have uh, any, uh, any doing with Central and to, to, to see or be a part of a, a worship service that's taking place. And so, Lord, I know there's folks watching who aren't saved. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray today that you save somebody uh, this morning. Lord, we love you, and we pray these things in your name, the name of Jesus, and all God's people said Amen and amen. Hey, please be seated again. Thanks for standing for the uh, public reading uh, of the Word uh, of God. And so, uh, again, I am encouraged. I know this is not uh, what we uh, absolutely like or uh, wish we were in in this uh, virus and pandemic and stuff. I'm encouraged by the number of people who gathered the comments uh, that you get in about what the Lord's doing uh, in your life. Uh, I tell you what, the Lord has uh, done this somewhat with the quarantine, man. Many of you have been spending time uh, in the Word of God, and the Lord's been speaking to you. And probably out of this, the Lord maybe has placed a calling on your life in some form or fashion. And so, man, I'm just grateful for what the Lord is doing, even in the midst of something we didn't expect. And I think we'd all say that we didn't really want or like at that time. But again, uh, we know that the Lord uh, is in control. So what we got to do, number one, we've got two parts of this. So it's fight to, to really know God truth, but also number two, fight to show God's truth. When Moses starts off here in verse one, he said, now this is the commandment, the statutes. Okay, now a couple of things you work down through there. He says to do them, and then he says, so that in verse two, you might fear the Lord. And then as you look kind of at the end of verse two and you get into verse three, he talks about, so it may be well with you. It may prolong uh, your life. And then we go down when we see the Shema, we're going to talk about it, the Shema, where he says, love the Lord God, heart, mind, soul, strength. But we also see in verse 6, this is all part of this first part. He says, these words I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. Now, we know this. You, we've shared this before. There's the head knowledge and the heart knowledge. Okay, The head knowledge is that intellectual knowledge. I grew up uh, in a Baptist church. I had a lot of intellectual knowledge. I knew the stories of the Bible. I memorized the Beatitudes when I was a, a young boy. I'd memorized the commandments. I had some great uh, Sunday school teachers, uh, Mr. Paul and Miss Maudie uh, Sager. And even as a, a young boy, I mean, they, they taught us for years, it seems like. And so as a young boy, I memorized Scripture, uh, even though I wasn't saved. I, I had that stuff in my head, but I didn't have it in my heart. I knew it here, but I didn't know it there. And, you know, some people said that's about 8 inches or 11 inches uh, difference. And it's really the difference between heaven and hell. There's a head knowledge. There are going to be many people who end up in the place called hell, separated from the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew the things about God, but they knew with their head, not with their heart. So that, what that means is they didn't believe with the heart. They didn't follow 
uh, with their heart. And so when he says this, this shall be on your heart, okay? It shall be in your heart. It should be in the inner man, and it will come out in what we do and how we function. Uh, and that's when he talks about these things. So let's talk about, he says, you've got to do this. Now, when he talks about the statutes uh, and the commandments, he's referring back, and most Old Testament scholars will say this, he's referring back to what he's given as far as the Ten Commandments. Now, a lot of you have watched the movie. Uh, maybe you know the passage. Uh, Moses goes up on, the, up on the mountain. The Lord gets with him, and he gives him the Ten Commandments. And now there's a time he comes down, people going crazy uh, and stuff, and uh, they have... Uh, thought that uh, the Lord had abandoned them. You go back and read that stuff uh, in Exodus. But what we see here is that the Lord is that he's giving these commandments and these statutes. Now, I, I brought something with me this morning. When I say I brought it, I just brought it from out in the foyer area, which was uh, out there when you first come in one of the entrances uh, in the church, okay? And so, uh, this is known as the Ten Commandments. Now, this is just a plaque, and so it's got them listed out here. And some people say, well, Archie, uh, well, that's old school. Well, it's not old school. It's the now school, okay? We'll call it that. And, uh, but do you realize that this plaque like this has caused so much controversy uh, in our nation? I mean, it's like people lose their minds uh, over this. So, you know, there's been petitions and lawsuits about this can't be in a courtroom. This can't be anywhere. This shouldn't be on any uh, land that's public. It shouldn't be in any buildings. It can't be uh, in the school. I mean, you can't have anything to do with this. I mean, you know, and you, you got to ask yourself a question. Why do people that go crazy uh, like over the Ten Commandments. And I know some will say, well, that's a separation of church and state, you know, and that kind of stuff. And, uh, but it's really because most people don't want, don't want anybody telling them what to do, okay? And so when you look at the commandments and you see this, we'll talk about these very briefly, but these are, uh, man, these are like guardrails, okay? And I, I don't know about you, but I'm afraid of heights. So whenever I go to one of those places, even as a kid, I'd go to a place, we'd go on vacation, it'd be one of these very high areas, it was some great lookout point, and there was always a plaque there that would talk about, well, this is where one of our forefathers stood when, whatever, you know, and you'd read through that, and, but it would always be a little sign that says, do not climb over the rail, you know, do not climb over the rail. And uh, well, the rail was there for the reason to protect you. Well, I'm scared of heights, so I couldn't even get next to the rail. I couldn't look over the rail. I would always think, I'm going to fall over the rail. It's almost like it was just pulling me from down below or something. And so sometimes I'd lay down and try to look over the edge of something. But there would be that sign that says, don't climb on the rail. Don't go past the rail because it's very dangerous. Now, this is what the Ten Commandments are. And, and the Lord has given us these uh, out of his great love for us. So if you look at these, he says, number one, he says, uh, thou shalt have no uh, other gods before me, okay? And I believe this is in like King James language. So have no other gods before me. So the, when the Lord is giving us that command, he says, do it. And he says, obey it. it it's for the reason uh, that he loves us. It's for the reason that he wants to protect us and he knows what is best. So he says, don't have any other gods uh, before me. Uh, number two, he says, uh, uh, don't make uh, any graven image, which means don't have uh, an idol. So, you know, I love, uh, Angie and I live out in the country, and so I love being able to go out at night, and to, because sometimes it's what you say, it's country dark, and you go out at night, and you see the stars, and you see all the, man, the creation, and, and so it's just a place for me, and early in the morning, man, when the sun was coming up, I, even this morning, I left, headed here at 5 o'clock a.m. I got up at 4 this morning, I left uh, home at 5. It was already beginning to break day uh, somewhat. I don't know if you realize that uh, or not, about 520, I guess, already beginning to break day. Man, you get around 6 o'clock and the sun's starting to come up and stuff. So anyway, I love morning. So it's a great opportunity just to praise the Lord. But what some people do is they want to worship the creation instead of the creator. And so what it is, they'll make an idol out of that. So that's where a lot of times people go, well, well, hey, man, that's an opportunity. Be out in nature and I'm going to go hunt. I can worship the Lord, you know, out there and stuff. And so what happens sometimes we'll make an idol out of that. Uh, number three says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I remember learning this as a kid. My parents teach me, don't, don't swear by the Lord. Don't use his name uh, in vain. Uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. For the Sabbath in the Old Testament uh, was on Saturday. In the New Testament, we, you know, we come together, we worship on the Lord's Day. But in reference to Ten Commandments, it's talking about being a day of rest. One thing I learned, I learned as a kid 
uh, we'd have visiting preachers come in, and so we'd have service. We had one service. We had one Sunday school, and then the preacher would come home with us. We'd eat a big meal. He'd get in the recliner. He'd take a nap. He'd get up about 4 o'clock and head back to the church, and we'd go back that night. And I just kind of grew up that way. I grew up with Sunday afternoon naps uh, as I got older. Uh, sometimes we'd slip off, go to the river, to the sandbar on Sunday afternoon, but have to be back in time for church so folks show up with a blistered face or, or whatever. But as I became a pastor, and, and even here at Central, Sunday for me up at four, leaving the house after five, here in the worship center praying at six, meeting at seven with the staff, start preaching at eight. Many times on the Sundays, I don't get home at 1.30, uh, 2 o'clock. And then on Sunday evening, stuff we have going on, man, I'm coming back. And I, I've grown up in that. And, and what I learned even early on in seminary is that sometimes for pastors, having that day of rest, Sunday is not that day of rest. And so our bodies are designed to work six days a week, but to rest on one. And as you read the passage, it carries that idea when you focus on the Lord, concentrate on the Lord, but it's a day of rest. Uh, so we see that one there. Number five, honor uh, your father and mother. It's talking about respecting them, uh, taking care of them, even those of us who have older parents, you know, and, and, and listen to them. Uh, thou shalt not kill. I mean, that's evident in regard to murder. Uh, how shall, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, we understand that. Having sex outside of marriage or a married person being involved uh, with someone else shall not steal. I mean, don't steal stuff. Uh, shall not bear false witness. Don't lie. Uh, don't covet, okay? And when you read that, let me set this down. You know, I didn't really realize how heavy that was until I put it up there and was holding on to it uh, for so long. But uh, when you read that part, uh, right there about covenant. It's talking about not coveting uh, your neighbor's wife. Now, what is that? Those are guardrails, okay, to protect us. He said, so when you go into the land, he says, you're to keep these commandments. Now, some people say, well, you see, you may know that, but the, the idea is that do you do that? Do you obey that? And I know for me, uh, Angie, my family will tell you, uh, I, I, I'm a doer, and I like working, and I love coming together uh, uh, on Sundays. I love multiple services. And I know some people say, well, you know, it's multiple congregations on the roof. I know. I, I love it. And I, I, I'm, I'm a morning person. And when I stand here all morning uh, and preach, sometimes I look at my phone. It's like I've walked 50 flights of stairs is what it amounts to uh, in doing that. That's how long it'd be on your feet. And so, man, I can... Uh, I, I lean more toward many times, and I guess I could confess my sin, as being that workaholic. I get on that side. I mean, we have to balance those things, but we all need. So that's just one there. Why is that? It's for protection. You know this. If you work seven days a week, uh, you're going to just burn out uh, in that. And so you can watch all the or look at all the studies you see by this for your health. Man, when you live by this and obey this, you are a healthier person. Uh, you don't carry around uh, guilt. Uh, you don't carry around anxiety. And, and why did the Lord give us this? People say, well, he's just a killjoy. don't want anybody to have any fun. No, it's for our protection. But the enemy, hey, the enemy wants you to violate every one of those, okay? Because he knows what happens. You see, God's Word, uh, God's Word brings health. And God's Word brings peace, you know. But some people don't even see that because it's almost like, well, if I don't know that, then it has no effect upon me. I had to take a business law class for my ag business undergrad. And uh, in business law, I'll never forget this as long as I live. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. You may say, I didn't know that. And the judge can refer to you. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Ignorance of God's word is not an excuse. It is not an excuse. That's why you got to fight to know God's truth, okay? So you may know it here, but do you know it here? And that's what we're talking about in this passage. So he said, you got to do this. You got to obey it. And he said, so your son, your grandsons, three generations will fear the Lord, which is the idea of worship. It's the idea of honor. It's the idea of respect uh, in that. So that you might fear the Lord. And he says that it may be well with you uh, in your life. So we know this, so that it may go good. It may prolong uh, your life that you may multiply greatly. That is the idea that we see here. So again, you got to fight to know God's truth. Then we get to verse 4, and that's the Shema of the Shema. He says, hear, O Israel, which means to listen, okay, to listen, to do. And he says this, he said, love. He said, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Do you know that Yahweh is our Elohim, Yahweh is one, okay? 
or Jehovah, the English rendered. Jehovah is Elohim, which I've shared this before. Elohim is plural. Most Hebrew scholars, too, in that plurality, it's not two, it's three. So when you look at that in the uh, Old Testament, uh, it, it I believe, gives the indication that Yahweh uh, is the Trinity, basically Elohim, God, and that's a word for God, Elohim, plural. Uh, Ella, uh, Yahweh is one. So we see the idea, I believe a picture here of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. So he says, this is, and two, I know I'm moving kind of fast this morning, but two for the Shema, any Orthodox Jew is going to recite this, okay? Now they're not they're not followers of Jesus Christ, okay? They don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. And that's a whole other thing coming later in eschatology and what's going to happen. Many Jews are going to get saved. They're going to realize who Christ is. So they're still looking uh, for that Messiah, but they, they quote this every day for an Orthodox Jew. And he says uh, this, he says, You shall love the Lord God with your heart, with your soul, and with all of your might. Okay, that heart, that inner man. Okay, uh, that everything uh, of your being with the soul, uh, all the life and awareness that we have. That's kind of one definition, that with all your strength. So we're to love him in such a way. Now, this right here in that Shema points to the exclusivity, okay, of the Lord God. No other gods. Just like that first command, have no other gods before me. So the idea is, he says, put this on your heart to love him in that way. We talked about you got to fight to know God's love last week, and you got to fight to show God's love. You got to be able to, uh, you can't know it or show it until you receive it, okay? That you're born again, believing that he died on the cross for your sins, when raised from the dead. So we're to love him with the totality of our being. When the scribe came to Jesus uh, early on in the gospel, was asking, what's the greatest commandment? He responded and said, love the Lord God, heart, mind, soul, strength. So he's talking about the Shema. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, upon these two commandments hang everything else. It's like a coat hanger. And so by Jesus responding to that, he's talking about the totality of surrender uh, to the Lord uh, God Almighty. We're to love him in such a way, and this is when we talk about fighting to know God's truth. So loving him, not with the head, but with the heart, everything about you. That's why the enemy wants to come against that. As a believer, the enemy cannot, uh, he cannot win your soul. If you're born again believer in the Lord Jesus, the Bible tells us that our, man, we have a citizenship in heaven. The enemy cannot win your soul, but if the enemy can paralyze you, in any way. If the enemy can paralyze you in any way, even regard to the commandments, whether if it's adultery, whether if it's honoring your father and mother, and I know there's some, maybe there's been words that have been spoken for some of the children or teenagers there that you haven't honored uh, your father and mother uh, in that. And man, the, the Lord forgives and the Lord renews, you know, you come to him uh, in repentance. I mean, he does that. But, uh, and we see that he's given this as, as guardrails. But for the Lord tells you, he said, it shall be on your heart, okay? Not in your head, in your heart. And to practice these things. It is a, a fight. When we, we think about those who were Roman soldiers in the New Testament, we know this. That Roman soldiers, they had a, like cleats in their sandals. Uh, we know in that culture and the, the history of the time, they, would, they wore uh, cloaks and coverings, but they would put them in their belt. And that's when the Lord tells us to put on the belt of truth and you kind of gird yourself up, but you get ready for battle, and you'd stand, you'd stand foot to foot, and you would do battle. In this life, man, you've got to fight for your family, and one of the practical aspects of that this morning is that you've got to take responsibility for uh, your family. I mean, you've got to accept responsibility uh, for your family, and so you've got to do that. That's number one. Another aspect here, too, just very uh, practical about this, and I know we share this all the time, but Man, you've got to spend time uh, in God's Word. You've got to spend time uh, in God's Word. And so, man, I encourage you, if you haven't signed up for the Scripture reading that comes uh, uh, every day. I know I'm just in a season of life. Uh, Pastor Blake and I talked about this even last week on our table time deal. And we're going to spend more time this week kind of fleshing out some more of this practice, uh, more of this passage into very practical uh, ideas, but I'm in a season of life where, man, I'm just reading through the scripture that's sent uh, every day, texted every morning uh, at five o'clock, because again, that's when I get up during the week and get up at four on Sundays, but uh, 
I'm just that morning person, but man, that's the season of my life. And that's where we're reading this together as a church. Uh, there are folks are memorizing passages of Scripture. Uh, out of that passage, it's sent uh, every day. It's just a good thing. So you're knowing God's Word, but you're also doing that, okay? You're doing uh, God's Word. And so it can be some of the simple things uh, that we see in life. Man, not, not lying and not cheating because he's the enemy. Those are the things that he desires. And again, for me, it's just thought, man, a time of, of rest, you know. Angie even asked me uh, last night, she said, when you get in, uh, in the morning, uh, you know, when you get in from the services and that stuff, or tomorrow, I said, we got going to take a nap, you know. Uh, and she said, I know you need to rest uh, in that. And again, that's the places I fail uh, in regard to that. And so, man, doing it so that you might fear him, which is the idea of worship him, so that you might love him. You see, we got to accept responsibility of our families. We got to practice it and flesh it out. We got to be in the Word of God. So, yes, you know it with your head, but you apply it into your heart. So, you've got to fight. If, if you're in a situation today and, and maybe through all this, man, it's just revealed some stuff in your life and some things in your family, and you're going to have to just, uh, I mean, you got to fight for your family and fight uh, uh, for God's truth. And so it's going to take, it's going to take a discipline and it's going to take application uh, in your life to do that. So that's kind of that first part of this, man. We got to fight to know God's truth. But here's the second part. We got to fight to show God's truth. In seven through nine, he says, you shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk about them when you sit in your house and you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up and you're to bind them. Okay. He's talking about having the scripture uh, verses around you and the, the Word of God. And uh, we know for the young Jewish boys, they were to uh, memorize and learn the Pentateuch. It was just how uh, they were trained. So again, you've got to accept responsibility for your family. Let me share uh, just about three things with you. I've shared this before, but as a, uh, because I know not everyone who's watching this is a parent. Not everyone has a uh, small children at home. I know Angie and I, we, our, our kids are grown and we've got grandkids now. But this applies to all of us. Uh, you, as an individual, as a believer, are the primary teacher of your family. Okay, you have an opportunity and you have a responsibility. Three uh, aspects I want to share with you. The church was not designed to replace you, but to assist you. You need to grasp that and understand it. The church was not designed to replace you, but to assist you. Here's number two. The government was not designed to replace you, but to protect you. You know, uh, sometimes people, when we see this here, one of the commandments is, uh, thou shalt not murder. And so sometimes what happens, we take this, these things and we apply them in different ways that may fit us or what we like. So people can do that. But do you realize that God has given authority to the, govern the government to, to punish evil doers? Do you realize that the, that the Lord has given the government, in Romans 13, government, has given the government certain authority, and one of that is to punish evil doers. Now, I know uh, you get into the discussion about capital punishment and that stuff, but do you realize that the Lord has given the authority to the government to punish evil doers? The government is for, and I know that the government can maybe, and we've seen this in history and other nations, whatever, they've gone past their authority that was given to them by the Lord uh, and that kind of stuff, but do you realize that the government is there to protect? And, and so it's not there to replace you, but it's there to protect you. And so, man, that's why, hey, I'm a, uh, I, you know, and, and talking about the government, that uh, I, I know, man, the government gives assistance. I mean, uh, uh, many folks are able to receive a stimulus package, you know, and that kind of stuff. And, and that, and you say, why's the government doing that? Well, they're trying to protect you, trying to protect the economy uh, and that kind of stuff. But it's not there to replace you, but to protect you. Let me give you the last one too. Uh, the school was not designed to replace you, but to support you. Uh, I can remember with a uh, man spelling. Uh, I cannot spell cat. I think it's genetic. And I can remember uh, early on when we were raising our boys, Angie made a deal with me. She said, Archie, I will cook supper and I will 
make sure Taylor gets his homework done if you'll do the homework with Ty. I said, okay. Well, neither, Ty's like me. Neither one of us could spell. And we would go over those spelling words and over those spelling words and over those spelling words. And sometimes I'd ask Ty, I said, is the teacher teaching you this stuff, you know? Uh, he's like, well, yeah, but, you know, uh, I wasn't paying attention or whatever. And, uh, and, and so the government, the school, the school's not there to replace you, but it's there to support you uh, in that. And so as a parent, we have a responsibility, and our responsibility is to pour in to the next generation. So as a parent or an individual, man, we got to know who we serve. We got to know who we live for. We got to be totally, when he says, love the Lord God, heart, mind, soul, and strength, totally surrender to him. You know, I learned a long time ago, there are so many things that are outside of my control. There's so many things that happen that are outside my control. There's so many things that I, you know, some, I'm bad about this, and I, I, I had to just confess and repent at times. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes you're standing in line in a store, and, and I'm kind of watching what's taking place. And so I'm kind of looking at the big picture and people standing over and over here. And, and uh, the line's backed up. People are frustrated. I was, you know, and people get mad and leave. And I'm thinking, like, if y'all just let me help you, I could help you get lined out how to process this stuff faster. Uh, you know, in that, I don't know if you fail in that, but sometimes uh, I, I do. And so uh, that frustration of that, uh, that leads to that. Uh, but man, you know, one thing is we may teach what we know, but we reproduce who we are. We may teach what we know, but we reproduce who we are. You see, we got to fight to know God's truth, but we got to fight to show God's truth. I've shared this before, and I'll, I'll kind of close out with this. He says, you got to talk about this with your kids as you go, by the way. We're going to flesh this out this coming week. Uh, but we're going to give you some uh, practical aspects. I know Blake has young kids at home, and so he's living that now. I know what Angie and I used to do, but we're about to go back into the realm of uh, grandkids as they're getting older, and they're going to be in our home. But things that you do uh, at mealtime, when you gather together for uh, dinner at night, uh, things that you do at bedtime. Uh, and so this is the idea when he says you've got to walk down through there and you've got to teach. You've got to take responsibility. You've got to be that steward. Uh, you've got to uh, pass that on uh, to your kids. You, you've got to, I want to say, kind of drill it in uh, to them in, in response to the Word of God. So here's what I want to kind of close with. If you are the parent, and, and it's one of these things you may say, well, aren't you just going to agree to disagree on this? And, and, and there are times I say that, so I understand it. But if you're the parent that says, well, you know, I've got an eight-year-old son, and I'm going to allow him to make his choices uh, about uh, Jesus. And, and, and I understand when you say that about Jesus, who he is. But ignorance of the law or ignorance of the Word of God is no excuse. And I remember when Adrian Rogers said this a long time ago. He said, we're not responsible for the choices our children make, but we are responsible to teach them to make the right choices. And that just really stuck in my head. And if you're the kind of parent that says, well, he's eight years old, I'm going to let him make a decision whether he wants to uh, uh, attend church or not. So you might have even said this morning, I'm going to let him make a decision whether he wants to be a part of uh, this time of online worship or not. When, when we let young children begin to make those decisions, they have the propensity to choose wrong. I am so glad. I am the person that was not saved growing up. I'm the person that was at, if we say at church, okay, we didn't have the internet when I was a kid or whatever, you know, but I'm the person who was at church whenever the doors were opened. And, and, and it was just, my daddy had that rule. I've shared it before. If your feet are under my table, you're going to be at church on Sunday. And so I just knew that. And I'd come in from college. I'd be at church on Sunday. I didn't make a choice whether I was going or not. I went because my daddy said that's what I was going to do. And I just want to say, thank you, daddy. Because on the night that God touched my heart, I was minding my own business, but I was at a revival service, and uh, I don't really remember. It's because anybody invited me or whatever. Uh, I had been attending Win Baptist Church, and I said, hey, I'm going to that service. Why? Because I just thought, well, that's what I need to do. And in that service is where the Lord touched my heart. You never know when God is going to touch somebody's heart, especially in the lives of teenagers uh, and children and doing that. So we have a responsibility. You got to know God's truth and you got to show God's truth. Hey, you may teach what you know, okay? You could teach this and someone can memorize it, but do you have it in your heart? You may teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. And so we see that getting fleshed out. Now, 
Some people say, well, none of us are perfect. You're exactly right, and we make mistakes, okay? The Lord is good. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, somebody out there who's watching at home, they say amen to that. Praise God. Uh, hallelujah. But we have a responsibility, and especially in our family. And so you got to take responsibility for your family. I know there's some of us that say, man, I, I wish, Archie, I could go back and make a brand new start. Well, you can't go back and make a brand new start, but you can start from now and make a brand new ending. You know, we've all got things in our life that have happened and taken place that we regret, that we messed up, that we made mistakes, but praise God, we can start from now and have a brand new ending. I know there's some of you who are believers uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and you may say, man, Archie, this has been a great time uh, for me. Maybe uh, you've been quarantined or furloughed or, or the wording of that, however that is, and so maybe uh, you may been able to work from home, but uh, instead of driving in the office, maybe you've been able to have some awesome quiet times in the morning, of being with the Lord, been disciplined about that, and the Lord is showing you stuff. I say, praise God, hallelujah. I, I pray that this right here should just remind you and encourage you and strengthen you uh, in that. There may be others out there, though, you're believing the Lord Jesus. Maybe the enemy has really taken a toll uh, upon uh, your family, and maybe there's been some words that have been said and things that have been shared. And so, man, I just encourage you, we get through uh, this morning, is maybe you get with your family and say, man, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I know we, we had a blow up yesterday or whenever, and we said some things you shouldn't have said, and I ask your forgiveness uh, of that. And so, maybe it's a, uh, a way you kind of come together, and that may be a way that you maybe just need to recommit uh, your life to Christ this morning. Say, Lord, I just afresh and anew, uh, I commit uh, myself uh, to you. It may just be that you just need to pray and say, Lord, just need a, a wisdom. I, I don't know. I, I don't know your realm uh, that you're in, but the realm I'm in uh, as a pastor of the church and shepherding is, you know, making decisions and having wisdom and and, uh, you know, how it affects the flock and vice versa and back and forth. And so maybe you just need to pray and say, God, just pray for wisdom. Just pray for discernment, uh, Lord. And when we ask and we come to him sincerity and faith, I mean, he answers uh, that. So maybe that's where uh, you are uh, this morning. Or you may be watching and you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus. Oh, man, I want to tell you, the Lord loves you. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. You know, you may be that, that person who knows about him, but you don't know him uh, with your heart. You may be the person like me that you can quote the Ten Commandments, you can quote the Beatitudes, you memorize that. There may be other passages that you learn, but you're not a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know here, but you don't know here. You don't love him with heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and so you realize, hey, I've just been all about me and what I want and how I'm going to do this. And if you come to him in sincerity and faith, believing in what he did on the cross, that he died for you on the cross, was raised again on the third day, and you come to him in repentance, he will save you. Boy, there's been a lot of folks too. Uh, uh, I know uh, being online and, and the word going out and the gospel going out and people are searching for answers. Do you realize that during this time, there's been a lot of people come to the saving knowledge uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, you come to him repentance. The Bible says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why don't you call upon him right now? Why don't you just pray and say, Lord Jesus, hey, I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, you're the Savior. Lord Jesus, uh, you're right. Lord Jesus, I'm wrong. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. And uh, Lord Jesus, I put my faith, my trust in you. I believe in what you did on the cross for me. I believe you shed your blood for me. I believe you're raised again on the third day. The Bible is very clear. If you call upon him, he will save you. And I want to tell you, when, man, when I called upon the Lord for him to save me, I didn't, say, I didn't hear music. There wasn't like angels flying around, you know, or whatever. But here's the deal about the Word of God, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. That was a verse that God used. My life for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, so no man may boast. But I can remember looking at that verse. And I can remember after I called out upon the Lord to save me, I can remember looking at that verse of Scripture. And here's what I, I said. I believe I said it oddly. I said, that's truth. I said, that. It's truth. Now, you say, what's the difference? You said you knew the Bible. Yeah, I knew Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 before, but I didn't know it as truth. I knew it here. I didn't know it as truth here. And when the Holy Spirit spoke to me from that verse, I was confronted with my wickedness and my evilness, and I knew he was only going to save me. And it was an overwhelming effect for me. It may not be like that for you, but it was for me. And I just said, oh, God save me. I said, that's truth. You see, we got to fight to know God's truth, and we got to fight to show God's truth. Hey, let me pray for us this morning. Father, uh, 
as we bow our heads there, there are folks watching at home. And I know, Lord, we're in this online services. And it's really, for here at Central, there's thousands of people that have gathered. Lord, there are folks from all over the around. There are some who need to recommit their life to you this morning. I pray right now they would do that. Maybe a, a child who's born again or a teenager or a mom or dad. Uh, Lord, I pray they would recommit their life to you. Uh, this morning, just a fresh and anew as a believer in you. And maybe there's some forgiveness that they need to ask for and repentance. And so, Lord, I pray that, that would take place. And then, Father, also, uh, I know that this morning, may, there's people out there who are, are watching, uh, teenagers and children who are not born again. Lord, may they call upon you right now in saving prayer, just praying, asking you to save them, to forgive them, repenting of sin and believing in what you did uh, for them on the cross. So I pray that today someone would be saved. Lord, and there are others maybe, Lord, who just, man, they're just praising you and, and exalting you right now in prayer. And so, Lord, we just say thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for who you are. And again, we just say, Lord, this morning, thank you that this world is not our home. We pray these things in your name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed to receive Christ this morning, hey, let us know that. We want to encourage you. We want to help you be disciples. We got some great resources uh, that we can send to you, uh, that you can do uh, online. We can give you some links that you can go to uh, and that kind of stuff. We have a lot of our groups. Uh, I know we've never really done this before, but they're meeting by Zoom. And so they're accomplishing uh, what we see in Scripture, fellowship and prayer and praise. And, and so they're doing, I know we're doing all of our meetings like that now. And I'm doing meetings around the nation and in the state, but also internally that's by Zoom. And so you might be looking for a group. And I know right now our groups are, are, are not meeting in that face-to-face -face, uh, situation uh, uh, because of the numbers and that kind of stuff. And, uh, but you can be a part of that. So you can be discipled. You grow. We want to help you uh, in that. So please let one of those pastors know. And if you recommitted your life uh, to Christ, we want to encourage you with that. And uh, maybe, again, it may just be something very simple as uh, studying the Word of God each day. So let uh, one of those pastors uh, know about that also. But I want you to know here at Central, we love you. Uh, we care about you. And we want to see God uh, work in your life. And I know that you're just like me. Uh, we're looking forward to that time uh, that we can be back together. And, uh, man, that, you know, I know you've been singing in your home for a while now. And uh, maybe you got five or six folks in your family, but you're probably like me looking for that time in the future when, man, the church family uh, will gather back. Uh, you can hear those voices. And, uh, man, that's going to be a good day. I can guarantee you this. We will not take uh, that for granted uh, anymore. I don't believe we will as a church family. Hey, may the God bless you. May the Lord bless you. May his face shine upon you. And I pray that you have a good week. And uh, I look forward to seeing you back next Sunday right here live, uh, 8, 9, 30, and 11 here at Central Baptist Church.